Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, so good to be together. Uh, however you're joining us, whether that's live stream, podcast, radio, on demand, just good to be with you. Please take a moment as you worship today to fill out the Connect card. Love that if you do it every week. Just let us know that you're connecting with us. It really helps to know we're here, we're together, and uh, well connected to Jesus and his mission. I do want to reiterate what Ken said. Our hearts are literally broken by this display of violence against women, against Asian Americans. You know, we stand under the authority of Jesus Christ who uh, reassures us every single human being is, is precious, made in the image of God and loved by him. So we condemn and we confess um, the sin of anti-Asian, anti-black racism and um, we pray for healing peace, reconciliation, and justice. It was good to talk with Harvey Drake uh, this week. Um, they certainly experienced a trial, that a fatal shooting in their building, not one of their congregation, but just he asked for prayer for um, the, the community passageways, the organization that was there. And also, I, I just want to pray that their sanctuary be reconsecrated uh, unto the Lord, a place of peace. Well, if you're just joining us, we're in this series called Unfollow, uh, because before we meet Jesus, the Bible tells us we follow three things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And uh, we want to unfollow these things in order to follow Jesus. Today, we talk about the devil, the third. Because in Ephesians 2, where we first began, we read that you once followed, Paul writes, the ruler of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. And today, in the text that we've just been chewing on, Ephesians 6, he, he says, stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And I say, wow, and what? You know, honestly, I think I'm a little bit out of my depth here with this message. Uh, I, I can get my head around the idea that there's something around me, the world, that pulls me away from Jesus. I, I can kind of understand that there's something within me, the flesh, that pulls me away from Jesus. But this notion that there's something above me uh, that pulls me away from Jesus, it's something that I don't know what to think about. And frankly, I don't think about very often. But we're going to do it today. We're going to jump in. Because let me tell you this. Um, years ago, I did a wedding in Florabama, Florabama, Florida. It's on the border there, uh, right on the Gulf. And flew out to do this wedding for some dear friends. After it was all over, late at night, went back to the hotel and thought, I'm in Florida. I got to hit the beach. So I pulled on my trunks and streaked through the lobby. And the, uh, the woman at the front desk, young woman, she said, sir, um, you're not going to go swimming in the Gulf, are you? And I said, yeah, you know, I got to fly back tomorrow. There's no time. She goes, uh, you don't want to do that because at night here, the sharks come in to feed and uh, it's full of sharks. So I, I, you know, thank, thank you for, I was really glad that she was on duty that day and that she was bold. I took a walk. But here's the lesson. Just because I don't know there's something out there believe there's something out there, or ever think about there being something out there, doesn't mean there isn't something dangerous out there. Stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of flesh and blood, St. Paul writes. Now he uses a word there, struggle, that isn't used anywhere else in the entire New Testament. It's a wrestling term. By the way, wrestling was very popular in Asia Minor where Paul's sending his Ephesian epistle. It's a wrestling term, struggle, uh, meaning to contend with, wrestle with. It speaks of hand-to-hand -hand uh, contact, close quarters, uh, two opponents standing up, locked in combat with one another. And the object is to throw the other one down. You know that you've won when you can put your hand on the neck of your opponent and hold them on the ground. Struggle. Our struggle. This is what Paul's talking about. Now, I, I, there's been a lot of struggle in my life and, and I dare say in your life recently. We've all been experiencing struggle recently. And just my Zoom calls last week, no small amount of tears 
we're shed in those calls. We're struggling. We're struggling with disease. We're struggling with loss. We're struggling with isolation. We're struggling trying to do school at home. We're struggling trying to work from home if we can work at all, struggling to pay the rent. We're struggling to care for people in our family and holding multiple roles at the same time. We're struggling against racism, against violence. We're struggling to be healthy. For me, I'm always struggling to be positive. Remember, Mr. Positive. And I just wonder if the Apostle Paul here isn't trying to tell the people to whom he is writing something positive about their struggle. That the struggle itself is a sign of something good in your life. Here's how Martin Luther, the German reformer, puts it in the 16th century. He basically says that an enemy doesn't bother you when you're not a threat. So, or in contemporary terms, as I say, you don't get shot at unless you're flying over the target. These are the words, listen to how Luther put it. He said, take it as a sure sign that you're in a right station, meaning calling, which is pleasing to God if you feel disgust and dislike for, for your calling. God is certainly at hand. So let me just, what he's saying is, look at your challenge, whatever it is you're working hard on. And, and if that challenge doesn't at some point appear to you to be disgusting, <laughs> something you don't like, it might not be a sign that something's wrong. It might actually be a sign that you're engaging something good in the world, that you're responding to a call that God has put on your life to do his good in your life for your neighbor and for his glory. You might just be working on that and you're provoking resistance from, from the powers of darkness and that's making it hard. That's making it unpleasant to you in this moment. That's making you dislike it and go, I give up. This is too much. I can't handle it. I'm exhausted. L Luther's point is, if you're feeling that way, it might just be that you're exactly where God intends for you to be, doing the work he has given you to do. It might be a sign that God is at hand. This has been so helpful to me. I just caught myself so frequently, daily, in some form of pandemic escapism. How about you? For me, it's been like um, browsing videos of beautiful scenery in Europe or browsing real estate listings somewhere in the world. They tell me that you can buy a house in, in Italy right now for one euro. <laughs> and I think in the midst of all that, there's just something inside of me, whether I'm aware of it or not, that keeps saying, this stinks. Something's got to change. This is just too hard. You're not up for the task. But as I think about Luther's insight, I, I wonder, maybe it's a sign, not of something wrong, but of something right. Maybe it's a sign or an indication that actually in my labor, trying to do what's hard to do, I'm actually struggling with cosmic powers. See, when good people rise up, there will always be something else that rises up to oppose. Paul says, I want you to know what's behind your struggle. I want you to understand the darkness. <laughs> Running into the waters of Florida in ignorance is not a strategy. Believe me, there's no one happier with my indifference, ignorance, or unbelief than a very hungry shark. I just look to him like lunch. And Paul says in this letter, I want you to understand what you're struggling with. Now, you go out with the guys for a beer and try dropping into the conversation a couple of non-ironic words about the devil. Try that. See what kind of reaction you get. If, if the image that comes to mind is a short little creature with red tights on, it'll be laughter, of course, right? But no one's laughing at the pandemic. No one's laughing at the war in Yemen. No one is laughing at your wife's eating disorder. Andrew Dalbanco is a professor at Columbia University, and in 1995, he wrote a book called The Death of Satan. Dr. Dalbanco writes, we live in the most brutal century in human history. But instead of stepping forward to take the credit, the devil has rendered himself 
invisible. The very notion of evil seems incompatible with modern life, from which the ideas of transgression and the accountable self are fast receding. Yet despite this loss of old words and moral concepts, sin, Satan, evil, we cannot do without some conceptual means of, uh, for thinking about the universal human experience of cruelty and pain. My driving motive in writing this book, he tells us, has been the conviction that if evil, with all its insidious complexity, escapes the reach of our imagination, listen to this, it will have established dominion over us. He's not writing a church book. He's writing as a secular liberal, for secular liberals. And what he's saying is that our desire, urgency to decry war and injustice and, and, and racism is without an adequate account of evil, without a conceptual means of understanding evil, impossible that we, were at, we will actually have established dominion over us if we allow the reality of evil, the metaphysical reality of evil, to remain anonymous or invisible. John Updike writes, the essence of evil, perhaps, is not to know itself. So, so what is this? Or who is this evil? Well, you, you, you and I could just make up our own ideas. We can say, this is what I think it is. This is what I feel it is. Or we can look at the Bible and see what it has to say about evil. Now, in our text here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, there are several descriptions. Again, rulers, Paul writes, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil. What are these? Well, I'll tell you, it would be a mistake to demythologize, and that's the word some people use, to demythologize these entities as though they only represent some sort of oppressive human system or some dehumanizing social structure. At the same time, it'd be a mistake to ignore the fact that evil does hide in oppressive systems and social structures. If you're looking for deeper understanding of systemic evil, and injustice, Paul is talking about exactly that. But, but he's also talking behind that about a personal spiritual agent of evil with limited, limited authority in this space and time. And, he, and the Bible gives several different descriptions, almost names for the evil one. I'd like to walk through four of them with you just fairly quickly so we can really understand who this evil one is. The first one is murderer. The Bible calls him a murderer. Jesus himself says the devil was a murderer from the beginning, John 8, 44. And when he says from the beginning, he's undoubtedly referring to Genesis where a serpent shows up who brings death by leading the first human uh, parents, Adam and Eve, to rebel against the source of their own life. He, in effect, leads them to death. And, and, and eternal death. And to this day, the enemy gloats over anybody who dies without first saying yes to Jesus, yes to his free gift of eternal life. He, he's a murderer. The second thing, he's a tempter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, we read, I was afraid that somehow the tempter had tempted you. The tempter has the ability to make what's good look bad and to make what's bad look good. In Paradise Lost, the, the, the Satan figure says this, evil be thou my good. The serpent in the garden s seems to be suggesting to Adam and Eve that somehow God is withholding something from, from them that he can't therefore be trusted. He, he encourages them to put self over God, sin over holiness. He has a way of making salvation look ah, unattractive, irrelevant, even boring. Tempter. And then thirdly, liar. <clears throat> John 8, 44, Jesus says, he is a liar and the father of lies. The... Uh, serpent lies in the garden. He misquotes God's word. 
Have you ever noticed that? The, ser the serpent says to Eve, did God say you can't eat of any of the trees? Well, no, God said you can eat of all of the trees except for one. See, he lies. He misrepresents God's word. He disguises himself as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11.14 tells us. He, bl he blinds us to the truth of the gospel and its power, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He lies about our identity. He lies about the world. He lies about God. He's a liar. And then fourthly, accuser. We read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 2, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. Oh, man, this is where accusation comes from. The evil one, he's an accuser. In fact, the Greek word for devil is slanderer, just the word for slanderer. The Hebrew word for Satan is accuser. He's slandering us, he's accusing us. The first accusation comes in the Garden of Eden when Adam, implicated in his own guilt, turns to his wife and says, she gave it to me. It's an accusation. Take her, he seems to be implying, not me. Well, uh, we are certainly familiar with this one in the modern era. Our divisions come from a tendency to maximize our perception of the sins of others and to minimize our perception of our own sin. And we're divided. This is very different from the conviction of the Holy Spirit that Paul writes about and Jesus uh, speaks about in John 16. The conviction of the Holy Spirit always brings relief, forgiveness, joy, and peace, and freedom, and leads to repentance. But the accusations of the evil one, it leads to shame, empty self-esteem, and despair. So this is the picture of evil, the person of evil, an, a murderer, a tempter, a liar, an accuser. The Bible tells he's real, and he rises against anyone who ever rises for good. And there's this struggle, struggle. So here's our question in the context of this sermon series. It's how do we unfollow the devil? Well, in a word, Paul gives us his answer. You stand. You stand, verse 11, against the wiles of the devil. Stand. He, and notice, he uses this word repeatedly, stand against the wiles, verse 11. Withstand, verse 13. Stand firm, 13. Stand therefore, verse 14. After eight times in this whole letter talking about the word walk, he's everything, do you notice in Ephesians, it's walk, 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 walk. And now in one paragraph, it's stand. Wait, don't walk. Don't walk. Stand. Stand. This is how we unfollow the devil. Now, Polybus, the Greek historian, just before Jesus comes along, uh, tells us that the one thing you can count on for a Roman centurion to do is to stand. Roman centurion knew how to hold ground, stand there. This is the way they engage in the struggle, and this is what Paul is, is asking his readers to do as well. But not stand in your own strength, and this is the important thing, stand with Jesus, stand with Jesus. He says, be strong in the Lord, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord. Stand with Jesus. He's talking about a Lord whom he's made known to us as a, as a gracious Lord. Remember, he says in chapter 2, for by grace you've been saved. And we've been raised up in Christ and seated in the heavenly places with Christ. So he's talking about a kind of a strength, the unique strength that comes from the Lord, not only just to stand firm and never be knocked down, but actually the strength that's stronger than that, which is the strength to get back up after you have. This is the kind of grace. Stand as one who can always get back up after being knocked off your feet. This is a greater strength. This is his strength operating in us. When life knocks you down, dear friend, when the hand of evil is on your neck, holding you down, Jesus raises you up. This is what Paul's teaching us. So mom, get back up. Student, get back up. Patient, get back up. Caregiver, get back up. Spouse, get back up. Artist, get back up. Realtor, get back up and stand again with Jesus. When you hear those voices inside of your head that say, you loser, 
you don't belong here. You're not good enough. You should be ashamed of yourself. I want you to tell those voices. That's the only time I'm going to tell you to do this. You tell those voices, you go to hell. Because that's what hell was made for. I like to say when I hear those voices in my head, or the voices of temptation, what Jesus said, when he said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You can really say that in the authority of Jesus. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what it means to be standing with Jesus. Notice the command here in verse 10. It's, it's actually a passive imperative. And if you'll forgive me, this is where I put my English major geek hat on. A passive imperative. It's a command, but it's in the passive voice. It means you let something happen to you. We really should translate Ephesians 6.10 this way. Be strengthened. Not be strong, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. See, he says it in the second part. That it's his power that makes you strong. So you're to be strengthened. And by the way, that's what the armor is all about in this text. And we, we won't take the time now to, to walk through the armor. I hope you'll study it. If you do, you'll see all of the imagery Paul uses here comes from Isaiah. It's all Isaiah's imagery, the vision God gave him. You see it in Isaiah 11, 49, 52. 59. It's the, in, in, in all of those passages, Isaiah gets a vision of the Lord, a divine messianic warrior who comes to stand up truth, to stand up justice, to stand up righteousness, to stand up faithfulness, to stand up God's people, even out of exile. And this is the good news, the good news of the gospel. Jesus is, Paul's noticing, fulfilled that good news. And Jesus is saying to us through Paul's words, Stay close to me, and I will give you strength to stand against the evil one. And that's what I'm trying to get at today. That's what I hope you take, take home with you if you write anything down. It's the words of Jesus saying to you in your situation, stay close to me, and I will give you strength to stand against the evil one. Stay close to Jesus. Can I give you two quick examples of what that might look like? One biblical and the other contemporary. Uh, first, Daniel uh, Daniel was a man of prayer, and it was that prayer that allows him to stand. He stands up in exile. Remember, he stands up to kings. He stands up with lions in the lion's den. This is how he struggles, how he engages the struggle with the strength of the Lord, because he kneels in prayer. And, and you know, Daniel goes to his little booth on his roof day after day for some 60 years, faithfully. It gets him into all kinds of trouble. And he probably is wondering, does this really matter? Is this worth it? Maybe I should be doing something else with my time. Well, I, my, in Daniel 10, I love this. He gets a vision. He's walking along the river Tigris, and a, an angel appears to him. And this angel says, hey, Daniel, I just want you to know what happens when you pray. Uh, there's this cosmic struggle up in the heavens. I, me and this other angel, we're pushing back the powers of darkness, and we're losing strength. But when you pray, you strengthen us. And we push harder. Wow. What would we like to hear that? To be given the ability to see that your prayers actually push back the powers of darkness. That they matter. You kneel to stand. And, and I will just tell you, you will never, you will never be, you, you're only as strong as you are close to Jesus in prayer. That's why Paul says, pray in the spirit at all times. Ephesians 6, 18, right here. Now, the other example is uh, Herman Hamilton, who happens to be a friend of mine, and uh, uh, he's a man of God's word. Uh, he, he stands by sitting to meditate on God's word. You may remember Herman Hamilton several years ago. He preached a wonderful sermon here. He is now the head pastor of a very large multi, uh, ethnic multi-campus church in the Bay Area. Early in his ministry, he was uh, the pastor of a very prestigious black church. Uh, Presbyterian Church in Boston called Roxbury Presbyterian Church. And it was, man, it was a tough calling. He was called there to preach God's word. That, that's his vision for this church. But, but he, he encountered all kinds of opposition from the powers that be. Well, Reverend Hamilton tells me the story. He says, one night when we're in the midst of the thick of it, I got this dream and it, I was being chased by a group of men and they were chasing me through the streets and I, uh, I was abandoned by a church officer and left alone. I was beaten to the ground. Somehow I got up and escaped. 
And then the scene changes. You know how dreams work. Uh, he says, then I was poisoned. I was on a hospital bed. And so, then these guys, they came chasing me again. And somehow I got up off the bed and I, somehow I escaped. And then I was on a boat and I was going up the stairs in the boat. And they were at the top of the stairs. And I turned around to go down. And they were at the bottom of the stairs. And I just about to jump over the rail to jump over the boat. And I heard this voice. He says, I'll never forget this. It was the voice of Jesus saying to me, as long as you stay close to me, you will always escape. And Reverend Herman says, I'll never forget those, decade, those words decades ago. Now, here's the question. How did he know that that wasn't just his burrito speaking in his dream? Or was it just his own voice? How did he know that was the voice of Jesus? And the answer is because he read God's word. He was a man of God's word. He was accustomed. He habituated himself to hearing the voice of the Lord through the written word. So that when Jesus spoke in a dream, Herman said, I know that voice. He's a man who stands by sitting to read God's word. That's what Paul says. The sword of the spirit is the word of, of God. Ephesians six seventeen. The word and spirit can never be separated from one another. And again, I'll say you're only as strong as you are close to Jesus through his word. Finally, be strong, Paul writes, in the Lord and in the strength of his power. I got a lovely note, and thank you for many of you who've been writing notes to us during this time. It really helps. And I got permission to share one note from somebody in our radio audience. And this gentleman says, you know, the Lord's been talking to me through this unfollow concept. He was thanking us for it. He's in his 70s, but he's a new believer in Jesus. And he writes this, everything for me is about undoing the past to make room for something new. Oh, what a great thing to say when you're 70 years old. Undoing the past to make room for something new. And that's really what Lent is all about, isn't it? I, I want that in my life and I want that for you. Making room for something new as we follow Jesus into the new thing that he's calling us to. Well, it's going to involve struggle. As followers of Jesus, we embrace struggle. We don't run from it. We understand it's normal, it's actually essential, and it's even life-giving. This is what we've been learning in the series so far. When the world tries to squeeze you into its mold, give yourself to God, living sacrifice, remember? And, and when there's the, something inside the flesh that says this is what you want, step back from yourself and step behind the Holy Spirit. Remember that? And then today, when the devil throws you down and puts his gray hand on your neck, you get back up in the resurrection strength of our Savior Jesus Christ and you stand. Because here's one more name for the evil one, and it's the most important of all the names defeated. He's defeated. On his way to the cross, our Savior says this. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. He's talking about the cross. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. John 12, verses 31 through 33. There it is. That's the, 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 the decisive defeat of our enemy in the cross of Jesus Christ. Defeated. At, at, at the cross, evil is unmasked at its worst. It crucifies the Son of God. We see it plain for what it is, absolute evil. But at the cross, evil is also completely disarmed. The only claim that Satan has against God's creatures is that they have rebelled, that they're worthy of nothing but death. But in the death of our Savior, that claim is nullified for all who put faith in Jesus Christ and who say yes to him, nullified. Satan has no claim on your life and no claim on mine when we stand up in Jesus Christ. Defeated. See, the sharks have lost their teeth. Let me say to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, never doubt in the darkness what you know to be true in the light. Be bold. Stand firm. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, wake us up. 
sleeper, awake, the apostle says. Let Christ shine on you. Lord, as we come into the beginning of spring, we open our minds, our hearts, our lives to the brilliance of our Savior, the sunrise from on high who shines upon those who sit in the shadows of death. His victory is secure. To that we say, Alleluia, we praise you, we love you. We want to open ourselves afresh to the fresh breeze and wind of your Holy Spirit that we might be bound more closely to our Savior Jesus Christ and walk in his newness of life in defiance of the evil one whose defeat is sure. We pray this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen.